Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. Why is this thing not working? Freaking A, man. Across distances they were never meant to fly. This is the most extreme type of flying you can do. There's a right way to fly an airplane and there's a wrong way. They take on the deadliest flights, ride out the wildest weather. I can't see anything, nothing. Every plane I fly in, I expect is trying to kill me. And do whatever it takes to survive. <laughs> but as long as there's money and fuel to burn. Smell that jet A. They'll live to fly another day. Let's roll. About 80 kilometers east of San Francisco. CB Aviation is scoring. A pilot embarks on a risky journey to change his own destiny. No, you don't understand. We're set to depart tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Corey Benson recently walked away from a lucrative car dealership to follow his passion for aviation. I knew there was a big risk, and I knew there was a very good chance that I wasn't going to make the money that I was making in the car business, but I wanted to do something that I loved. Corey's new job, selling and delivering small secondhand planes. In the industry, it's called ferry flying. And only pilots with nerves of steel need apply. They fly anything, anywhere, anytime. From single engine planes, through turboprops, and multi-million dollar jets. If it has wings, they'll take it, no matter how far. Well, we're not Kansas anymore, man. Or how dangerous. Bro, that's bad. It's a radical career change, but Corey is committed. I'm the type of guy that when I decide I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna find a way to make it work. I never look back. I don't wanna get back in the car business. I've basically put all of my eggs in this one basket and I will make it work. And here's the plane that Corey hopes will jumpstart his dream. This Merlin III, a sleek turboprop built in 1980. Corey bought it in California and sold it to a customer in Australia. To pick up his check, he's gonna have to fly the plane on a treacherous journey across the Pacific Ocean. The problem is, the Merlin doesn't have the fuel capacity. So Corey's hired a team of aviation mechanics to install an auxiliary fuel system inside the cabin. A retrofit that will turn the plane into a potential flying bomb. So let's go and check the system out. Now we're gonna stick in the aircraft. Everything's new and unfamiliar, especially this jury-rigged backup fuel system. So let's say that you want to use the right tank first. What you do then is that you open this valve here, and you open this valve here. Okay. The fuel control panel was built with a mix of aircraft, automotive, and plumbing parts. Put this the way it should be, okay? It's gonna be this way. And these two aluminum tanks will be installed in the cockpit each filled with over 300 liters of fuel. Let's disconnect this one here. It really looks kind of rinky dink. And put it on this side. You're starting to make me a little nervous. You're thinking about that there's going to be nine hours we're going to be over water, and we've got to control the fuel tanks on top of that. I want to make sure it works. I want to make sure it works right, and that we completely understand how to work this. So, so what happens if we had something with the airplane go wrong where we lost power, where it wasn't powering either of the inverters? Let's say you lose these two here. You lose everything on the aircraft and pressurization. You, you don't want that, you're in trouble. 
That's one of the scariest part about being a ferry pilot is you're in an unfamiliar airplane going somewhere very dangerous. Most of the people survive. You know, some of them die, of course, but most of them survive. This will be a steep learning curve for Corey. And it just got even steeper because he's landed another job. Perfect. OK. In the aircraft delivery business, you never know when the plane's going to be ready. Sometimes there's two or three flights that come together at the same time, which has happened here. Corey was hired to move a single engine Cessna 206. But this one is over 35 years old. So he's hired a top-notch team to take on the flight for him. Well, you get a good feeling to see if she's ready to go across the water, which we need her yes, to be ready to go across the water. So. Bob Rasky has logged over 23,000 hours in every kind of flying machine, from commercial airliners to fighter jets. I'll let you get up. OK. But you're you're, you're younger morning. and more agile, so. <laughs> His co-pilot, Yasmina Platt, has a fraction of that experience just 600 hours in small planes. That looks good there. But she's hungry for more. Be here and go and fly? Awesome. There's nothing better in the world than to go fly. Yeah, you know, baby, he's going to treat us well, right? You're going to treat us good? <laughs> this will be the trip of a lifetime, a flight over 10,000 kilometers long from California to Poland, across the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. And they've never flown together. Clear, bro. This first test flight will be a great way to break the ice. The engine sounds good, though, so far. It's very solid. Anything else, Captain? Nope. We're good to go. <laughs> Got to do that. I'm going to need to learn this one. <laughs> it's just one of many, one of okay, many. All right. Whoa. But just minutes into the test flight. Look at that thing. It doesn't respond. The old Cessna is misbehaving. Oh, it's not working? Nope. Uh-oh. The left aileron trim is not responding. Well, we tested them on the ground. They did work then. The aileron trim is a hinged flap on the edge of the wing. It controls the plane's rolling motion. With the left trim stuck, the plane is rolling to the right. They're coming down. OK, so descend. Bob decides to land. But he fights to control the plane. Down. Could just be old. If it can break, it will. Back in the hangar, the mechanic discovers serious evidence of neglect. You know, it could be caused just by the age of the aircraft or, or just the fact that it's been sitting for so long. We thought we had a safe airplane. It will take some detective work to figure out why the aileron trim got stuck and whether this is an isolated incident or a sign of even bigger problems. Either way, this old lady is grounded. You want me to keep running it? Yeah. From the safety angle, this delay is unavoidable. But for Corey's new business, it's a killer. Every day we delay it, it costs us money with pilot fees and hotels and everything else. And so from a business standpoint, I'm always pushing the pilot. With the Cessna in the hangar, Corey is pushing hard to make sure his mechanics keep his first delivery job on schedule, the Merlin 3 turboprop. They don't weigh anything. The auxiliary fuel tanks are ready to be installed. Just hang on. Flying this tricked out aircraft is going to take a special kind of pilot, someone who won't get spooked by a couple of fuel tanks sitting where the passengers are supposed to be. 
and someone with enough experience to help Corey on the tricky Pacific crossing. Let's get out of here. It's a job for Captain Randy McGeehee. All right, let's get out of here. Okay. He'll be Corey's partner on this flight. This flight will be the first time Corey and I have ever flown together. It's not normal to take such a big, difficult flight together as your first flight. Normally, you ease into it with a more routine little flight, but we're kind of going for it on this. Now that Corey's got a real pro on board, the full magnitude of this challenge is kicking in. At this weight and at these speeds, the airplane's going to be very hard to control. So we don't control the plane, we've got no chance at all. Most of the added weight is fuel. And now the tricky part, not to spill. Smell that jet A. And with two extra fuel tanks as front row passengers, this plane delivery is definitely not business as usual. Now, this is the first time I've ever fueled an airplane from the inside. But just when they're finally ready to go, a heavy fog rolls in. This is really low. We can't take off like this. Not with the weight that we're at. Not with what we're trying to do today. I don't want to be stuck here. We need to get this airplane down there. We can almost see the control tower now. It's You've got different control tower. Control tower is right there. All I see is a bunch of milky white fog. You can't even see the taxiway or the runway. Corey and Randy haven't even left the ground yet. And already, they're in a standoff. We're overweight. We're not going to have great climb performance. We've got mountains out here. I mean, if things go really bad, we could end up dead. We're going to go when it's clear, and that's when we're going to go. All right, and that's, that's, that's the end of it. All right. We're not going to do any more of these flights. If it takes us months to get the airplanes to our clients, they're not going to want to buy anything from us. And then we'll end up going bankrupt. We need to get going now. Corey needed an experienced pilot for this job. And Randy McGeehee fit the bill. So we need 3,800 pounds a side to fill it up. But Corey's the boss. And that can mean competing agendas. When it's outside of the airplane, then Corey's the boss, and he's making the decisions. I follow his lead, but when it comes to inside the cockpit, I'm the boss, and I'm calling the shots, and we're going to do what I say we're going to do. Clear. Departure's clear. Clear. Randy didn't like the look of the weather and delayed the flight's departure. But now that the fog is cleared, they're all set to go. It's hot out here. We don't have as much wind as our faces yesterday, but we're going to take off in the event of an engine failure. We got a nice long runway here. So once I have the airplane under control, you can call the tower and let them know. Otherwise, we'll return here for a visual land. Careful right. takeoff. Just going to use all the runway we can. Normally, they'd be in the air by now, but they're halfway down the runway and the plane isn't lifting off. 100. The heavy turboprop sucks up 1,200 meters of runway, a lot more than it should. The plane is just a pig, you know? No, that's not fair. We're just always so overhead. Yeah, we're, we're 15,000 pounds right now. They should be climbing four times faster. The winds down here are actually less. Our fuel flow is higher because we're so much lower than we thought, but we don't have the performance to climb up there. At this lower altitude, the denser air puts more drag on the plane, which burns more fuel. They'll need to climb up to where the air is thinner and keep an eye on the fuel gauges if they want to make it all the way to Australia. Back in California, Corey's second delivery is running behind schedule. The aging Cessna still needs a little TLC before she can take off on the transatlantic trip to Poland. Okay, 
we're going to where Bob is staying. And co-pilot Yasmina Platt takes advantage of the downtime to prepare for the dangerous journey ahead. I just want to see the survival equipment that he has. I'm a little worried about the weight and balance on the plane. The flying time from California to Poland is about 70 hours. Going across the continental US and above the icy waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. Oh my god. You're kidding me. We're taking all this? There's more. I just don't want to scare you. There's this. more? Absolutely, absolutely. Bob so Rasky flies commercial airliners. But for 25 years, he was a US Air Force instructor pilot, an F-16 flight lead, and a combat search and rescue pilot. Sure, OK, so like. He believes in coming prepared. See what we got here. I want to see like if we can prioritize some of this. OK, I understand some of the stuff is required, right? Like the rafts and stuff, which we don't even ha have here, which that's going to take up a lot of weight yeah. and space, too. Because if it was single engine over the Atlantic, there were no options, you know? I think he is a little bit obsessed, but that's what he's train for and you got military training which I didn't you know and he's probably been in situations where he might have gotten scared we have to take the required items sure and that's actually a lot of these things are required items. even yeah. a US flag yes even the US flag because this can give you motivation out there give yourself a sense of I'm gonna live Wave it. I'm gonna make it you know her concern is the airplane gets there on time meeting a delivery schedule and that's a very valid concern my concern is the plane just gets there Period. In the North Atlantic, you know, with 10 to 20 foot seas, I mean, it's going to be not easy to get that plane stopped straight ahead and just get out. I'm envisioning something hit, and we may even go upside down. Right. And that's the training we've gone through. You know, it's yeah. really kind of scaring me. For Yasmina, the idea of a crash landing in the North Atlantic has just become chillingly real. Once Bob started talking about, you know, we really need to take this, and, you know, we're going to use this here, it just kind of started making me really very nervous, to be honest with you. The next morning, Yasmina gives the plane a thorough safety check. It's very serious. We're losing fuel. Um, and, you know, that's just on the ground. But if we did go up in the air, who knows if we would be losing even more fuel. A few hours ago, she thought Bob was being overly cautious but the fuel leak has proved him right. You see how it's leaking, right? Like through the fuselage? Uh-huh, yeah. That one's really weird. And then it goes all the way back, and then it's dripping down here. So really, we have two. Yeah, we'll just... uh, how frustrating. The airplane mechanic takes a look and doesn't like what he sees. You could have caught fire when you're flying, the engine running, when your exhaust is right here, right next to where it's leaking. Yeah, fire is a second. Oh. The second thing I'm mostly scared of, the combination of fire and um, ocean would not be good. Yeah. Although, <laughs> I think I would still put it down, because I think I would still rather go down in the ocean than be burned. Fixing this new problem means more delays. That's OK with Bob, because with his kind of experience, he's got nothing to prove. You know, fuel, hot, metal, not a good combo. So we don't play around with that. The plane's not going to move until it's fixed. I'm not under the clock. I don't have any pressure. We want to get plane, us, there safely. Number one goal. Almost 2,000 kilometers away off the coast of California, Corey and Randy are fast approaching the halfway point on the first leg of their journey. So it's time to make a critical decision. Our fuel burn is higher by five to 600 pounds, which is half our reserves. One more strike, and we're pretty much out of the game. We're really going to have to uh, consider turning around. Ferry pilots call it the point of no return. When there's enough fuel left in the tanks to turn around, but if they go any further, there's no coming back. This is literally the point. we got to get it right for real. They've burned more fuel than they expected, and the auxiliary fuel tanks don't have gauges. So Corey estimates the amount of fuel they have left by checking the tanks manually. We're burning more fuel than we expected to burn. We're 8,000 feet less than we thought. 
Randy goes through another set of calculations before making his decision. So yeah, that's 70 more gallons an hour, and we're looking at almost eight hours. So that leaves us with 300 in the tank. But uh, the winds are gonna die down and we're gonna do better on this. We're gonna make it up. We're good, we're going, we're going. Randy's taking a calculated risk. But that's what this business is all about. And this time, it pays off. Today, at least, it looks like the sharks won't be chowing down on ferry pilots for lunch. We're gonna make it, man. Nice job, El Capitan. And now, they're dropping into their first pit stop. Hawaii, here we come. And so we're going to land with a little over an hour of fuel. Just a few hours ago, Corey wasn't so sure they were going to make it. Now, he's happy that he put Randy in the driver's seat. You're coming down. Got the runway inside. Slap set. Hydraulic pressures in the green. Prop sink is off. Nicely done. It's a nice landing though, Randy. Holy crap, we made it. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, thank you. In Hawaii, they get the traditional greeting. But Corey and Randy are on the lookout for the gas man. I don't care if we got fuel spilling out. We don't care if you spill a little bit. We're gonna measure, we wanna get a precise amount of how much fuel he's putting in both tanks so we can um, then subtract how much fuel we burned over the first leg and so we know exactly how much fuel we burned. They made the first leg from California to Hawaii with just one hour of fuel left in the tanks. Next stop, Pago Pago in American Samoa. And this time, they want to be dead sure they won't run out of fuel before they get there. Yeah, let, let's get out of here because I can tell the way the air feels, it's really hot and humid. So as the day progresses, that air is going to heat up and those thunderstorms are building. Yeah, let's get the hell out of here. Back in California, mechanics have sunk more than 10 hours into the Cessna. Now they think the old plane is good to go. Hopefully that's the last thing that's going to break on this plane. Yeah, I never want to see this one again. I'm just trying to get the airplane ready, and so now it's time to go. <laughs> that is beautiful. And if the weather holds up, Bob and Yasmina can finally take off and start clocking some serious flight time. Heck, you know, crossing the Atlantic is much more exciting. In a small airplane, it's going to give me a, a whole different perspective of uh, aviation. And along the way, I'll be thinking, you know, how beautiful the scenery is, but also how um, deadly it could be. And there are few places in the world so vast, unpredictable, and unforgiving as the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, I think it's going to be really big for my career. We're probably going to put about 50 hours on the airplane uh, between the test flights and the flights themselves. To this day, when I see some of these airplanes, it's like, wow. We went ahead, uh, went out, did the run up and everything, props fixed, uh, fuel strainer's good to go, so okay. you guys are ready. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate we'll it. See you. Yeah, we're so excited. It's starting to really become true. <laughs> We're good. Good to go? Good to go. The Cessna lifts off, beginning the first leg of a long journey. Destination, Poland, via the east coast of the United States. The so engine sounds pretty uh, strong, right? It does. I like it. Yeah, it's going to be like seven hours, six hours, seven hours of it. There's so there's the Golden Gate. Wow, absolutely beautiful day in San Francisco Bay. Oh, now look, if guys can make it from Alcatraz and swim to the shore and survive, then we can make it in the middle of the North Atlantic if we need to. You right? want to try it before we go? Like you would. Uh -huh. 399 can take off from 
20 minutes out, the old Cessna runs into a patch of rough air. The first sign of trouble ahead. Any rougher, these winds could do some serious damage. Okay, your seatbelt uh, on? Good? Yep. Okay. Oh. Bob decides to climb higher, hoping to escape the danger above the clouds. Hang on. Okay, going up to 1-1,000, right? Yes. Oh, hold on. Oh. Oh. This plane just can't climb, you know? I think after we top this one, we'll get a little better ride. Overweight and loaded down with fuel, the Cessna struggles to reach clear skies. Come on, baby. Bring us up there. This nice old machine. Hang in there. Cool. Okay. Ah. There we go. In the clear. Yay. In the clear. At this altitude, the aircraft is out of the danger zone. Whoa, oh, it's clear ahead now. Woo! Uh, I like here. it. 6,000 miles to go, OK? Yay! <laughs> but all it takes is one short moment for everything to change. Oh, what's that, man? OK, here, I got the airplane. Oh, my here. god. As soon as they reach their cruising altitude, a heavy stream of fuel starts flowing out of the right wing. Hey, uh, Senator, this is uh, 219 Quebec. Dad. Yeah, we're going to need to divert to Santa Barbara or the nearest airport right now. Emergency. Yeah, we have a, looks like a leaking fuel tank, a leaking fuel tank. No one, two, come back on able forward, your soul's on board. Two, soul's on board. One, two, come back right to that. Eddie's going to take you to the south end for the airport. The leak, uh, uh, it's still running. running. I wish there was a way that we could stop it from coming in. The closest airport is in Santa Barbara, 10 minutes away. Yeah, I'm just concerned about electrical fire. Absolutely. That would just not be good at all. Fire in the air, a pilot's worst fear. And with fuel pouring out of the Cessna's tank, all it'll take is one spark to turn the cabin into a fireball. It's really, like, pretty bad. OK, so it is leaking pretty good back there. Yeah. Okay. Bob and Yasmina have to get their wheels on the ground before they're blown out of the sky. OK, okay. I got us going towards Santa Barbara right now. All right, and I have Santa Barbara on the GPS as well, so okay. we can just, you know, use that. OK, good. You got the airplane, right? Out of the airplane. We're heading towards Santa Barbara. They're aiming for an emergency landing. So you know, since you are leaking fuel, we are going to roll the equipment for you. OK, keep bringing me in. Wow, it's coming to their door. OK, so what's the distance to Santa Barbara right now? 20 miles. Two, three, zero. will you be able to make the descent from your present position? We can. On the ground, emergency response units rush to the airstrip, preparing for the worst. They're on the ground but still not out of danger. Bob unscrews the fuel cap to release pressure and explosive fumes from the tank. As the emergency crew takes over, Yasmina finally allows herself to think about how close they came to total disaster. This could have been really bad. We could have had an electrical fire in any, you know, in a second. And imagine on top of that, it would have happened over the water. Now we're really screwed. Now we have an engine on fire, and the only place we can go is the water. That's all that you're thinking, really. Halfway across the Pacific Ocean, just south of the equator, Corey and Randy are flying straight into a dangerous roller coaster ride with a very scary name the Intertropical Convergence Zone. This is really dangerous. Turbulence down here is extreme. There are like little bombs going off everywhere. It's like a deadly beltway that circles the globe, where warm sea temperatures lower the surface air pressure and create a massive, violent mixture of wind surges, clouds, and rainfall. So we're either going to have to punch through 
or we're gonna have to convert a couple hundred miles, and I don't think we got the fuel for that. Holy crap! Feel that? Well, we got if we get severe turbulence, especially with how heavy we are. The wind can be damaged. I'm gonna slow it down here. Okay. Randy cuts back on the throttle and reduces their speed. But the wind resistance will cost them fuel. In case we run into any really bad bumps, we won't break our airplane. They've traveled more than 6,000 kilometers since leaving Hawaii. And after a quick refuel in American Samoa, they're nearing their next pit stop in New Caledonia. So Corey tries to contact the small island's airport. Damn it. Why is this thing not working? But the signal goes dead. There's no one out there. Bring it. Hey, man. His last option is the satellite phone. You're not going to believe this. The runway's closed. Our runway at New Caledonia is closed? Are you messing with me? No, I'm not. She said that the that the runway is closed and it's not going to be open until at least 0530. You're serious? Yeah, I'm dead serious. All right. I can't believe this. Jeez. It's starting to look like Corey and Randy are flying on borrowed time. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean, back in California, the tired old Cessna with a leaky fuel tank is going in for yet another checkup. You can bring it over this way a little more. The leak forced Bob and Yasmina to make an emergency landing, but it could just as easily have blown them out of the sky. You see right where the nipple goes into it? See at the base? Right at the... the plane's two main fuel tanks are made of thick rubber and mounted inside each wing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, no, the, the whole nipple is cracked off. You can really see it now here. Um, it's supposed to be behind the strut, which would be a negative pressure oh. area. Oh, that, that probably means the bladder is deteriorated inside too as well. The tank probably hadn't been kept full, so the tank is made out of rubber and it dries out. An old mothballed airplane coming out of storage can become a lethal booby trap for even the best of pilots. If it had happened over the Atlantic Ocean, it would have been ugly, because there's no place to land there. Our first impression of her, let's put it that way, is not very good. She just needs to treat us a little better. At this point, um, we're kind of low, you know, on energy and on confidence. Across the Pacific Ocean, above New Caledonia, pilots Randy McGee and Corey Benson are circling above a small airport. There's our island right there, huh? Runway is close. They have no choice but to stay in the air and keep burning precious fuel. Close the runway in the middle of the ocean where we have no other options for maintenance. It didn't tell us until now. I don't want to sit out here and hold for an hour and find out that they're not going to open it. Randy and Corey have no idea why the landing strip is closed. If there's a problem with the runway, ground control is not saying. Really puts a lot of stress on us. I mean, with this runway down, we have to divert. All of a sudden, fuel, where we're sitting nice and fat with it, all of a sudden, it becomes a major issue. So Randy radios in a request. Uh, we'd like to descend for a uh, landing, uh, 300 Alpha Lima. So uh, what, what are your intentions? Uh, we'd like to descend for a uh, landing, uh, 300 Alpha Lima. Uh, now runway uh, is open. Call me back uh, on the right hand downwind, uh, one one. Only moments after denying permission to land, the new Caledonia flight tower opens the runway. Crisis averted. Thanks for putting me in the middle of nowhere, buddy. an ocean away on the west coast of the United States. That's what it should look like. That's what it should look like. Mike the mechanic is showing off a brand new fuel bladder to Bob and Yasmina. That would be uh, what I would call an accident waiting to happen. It's lucky that you had 150 gallons on board. 
The new fuel tank can be installed in less than a day. But now the pilots are wondering if the old plane is hiding any more dangerous secrets. You know, once we start going over the ocean, we can't have these issues. If we had that going on yesterday, we would have been on the water. You know, from our perspective there, I'm starting to feel a little bit uh, like on a train that's uh, losing parts along the way. So the bottom line is uh, if we don't like the direction the airplane goes here in the next day or so, then we say no, period. Bob gets in touch with the boss. Hey, we're down here at Santa Barbara, and um, he's hoping he can convince Corey to pay for another complete inspection. You know, this is hitting the third strike here, so we're not moving further till it's totally, totally uh, exonerated and checked. Now, I'm glad you guys are OK, and I'm glad you guys got the plane on the ground safely, but we need to get it back in the air. The company needs it in Poland as soon as possible. Personally, I'm not comfortable moving forward with this airplane until it's uh, thoroughly checked by an independent source again. We're hired to move the airplane. We're not hired to do additional inspections. This aircraft has already had two previous inspections and deem it safe. So I don't know why we're doing additional inspections and wasting more time when we've got the skydive company in Poland super frustrated wanting their plane right now. Corey's time is Corey's money. And he knows that if a good mechanic looks hard enough, he can always find something to fix. We're surrounded by this concept of go, go, go. Time is something I can control just by saying yes or no. And by saying no, it gives me the time to make sure that everything's right. And it's about being right. But Corey's not all business. He's also a pilot. So he finally chooses to listen to his better instinct and agrees to the additional round of inspections. Because this is our last good check, you know? And you guys have been all over it, so. Yep, no problem. And if it costs Corey. Good. At least it keeps Bob happy. I was a mechanic in the, uh, the military, and they're going to feel that pressure for me all the way until we go, because we are not departing unless I feel happy that the airplane's good to go and ready. Over 10,000 kilometers away, Corey can now shift his attention back to his own delivery. Yeah, it was a little stressful in many parts of the flight, but be ready for a cocktail tonight. The corporate turboprop is now only 1,000 kilometers from its final destination, Sydney, Australia. This is it, man. Going into Sydney here. I'm a little tired right now, but uh, I can't wait to do it again. Holy crap, that's not good. That light means we have 10 minutes left of fuel. Holy The warning light indicates that the transfer fuel pump is malfunctioning and their auxiliary fuel is not getting to the left engine. I don't want to be freaking swimming in the ocean, dude. They have 10 minutes of fuel left in that engine. When it runs dry, the engine will fail. Respecting the left side, that's going to be this switch. The fuel shutoff switch, we're going to close. Hydraulic shutoff switch, close. With one engine down, the plane will lose altitude, and Randy will have to ditch in a controlled crash landing on the water. Right now, at any time if it's going to go, it's been 10 minutes. OK, uh, fuel pressure steady. Fuel flow steady. All indications are normal right now. Feel that? The low vibration reverberates through the plane. It sounds like they just lost the left engine. Oh, I mean, we're still sure we have fuel. That's something. That thing scared the crap out of me. Come on, baby. The minutes pass. The engines continue to fire. The problem seems to be a faulty warning light. Thank God. It's the longest 10 minutes of my life. Yeah. Let's, I think we're out of the danger zone, so let's just uh, keep going ahead here, OK? OK, awesome.
Back in the United States, a leaky fuel tank has been replaced. And now Bob and Yasmina think they might be able to coax the old plane into taking off and heading out for the long haul across the ocean. So Mike and Kim, would you take this airplane to Poland now when it leaves the hangar? Sure. The two pilots have been trying to put California in their rear view mirror for over a week now. It's good to catch all these things before we go, because my confidence goes better now. And I'll tell you, once we make it to Midland with no issues, then I'll feel even better. Well, we've still, we still got 3,000 miles to go. It's a long now, leg. Another issue than in this next leg, that, um, that's probably it for me. But it looks like today might be the day. The mechanics have signed off on the plane, and the pilots are ready to take the aging Cessna across the continental US with two pit stops, one in Texas and the other in Tennessee. By nightfall, they should be in Rhode Island. I'm just to the point that it's like, I value my life more than one trip, so. We'll see what happens, but hopefully, you know, we don't have any more issues with it. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean. We're over land, holy <laughs> Corey and Randy have made it to the finish line of their 12,500 kilometer journey to Sydney, Australia. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> The Merlin 3 corporate turboprop will be Corey's first international delivery. Nicely <laughs> done. Woohoo! Corey knows he couldn't have done it without Randy. People can say whatever they want about it. I mean, you and I did it. We brought this thing across an ocean. Fuel problems, airplane problems, weather problems, with just little, little teeny, teeny postage stamps of land in between. A plane that's not made to do that. And we did it, you know? What a trip. I feel great. I got goosebumps right now. It's a fun trip, great trip. Good to be here. It was an adventure of a lifetime. Minutes after touchdown, Corey gets ready to meet a happy customer. And for the first time since he took off, he's starting to feel confident that his new business is going to fly. He's very excited to see this airplane. I can't wait to see his face. He's going to be very happy with it. Um, this airplane, all in all, is a very nice aircraft. Wow. I think it exceeds all of his expectations. Thanks so much. It's going to sit on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. I hope well, it was worth the wait well, there, well you know? You. I thought it was just going to be, you know, sit up there and sit the autopilot and read a magazine, hang out. And that definitely was not the case. This trip is probably one of the most dangerous trips you can do. Back up north. Bob and Yasmina have made it to Rhode Island. We are here. It's nice to good job. touch ground. You did very good, very good. Here. Yeah, it was a good flight. Yeah. Uh -huh. You did very nice. The, uh, and she, she did as well. So how are you feeling about the plane, man? A lot better. But their confidence will be short-lived. I'll show you the filter over here. This is all, it's some steel, but most of it's aluminum. There's too much in here. During post-flight maintenance, mechanics discover the biggest problem yet. Oh my god. I've never seen this much. A so lot, where could it be coming from? Well, the steel could be uh, from the cam followers, you know, uh, a part of the cam. Bob asked the mechanic to perform an oil change, and he discovered metal filings in the engine. OK, because that's where the steel component is, right? right? So, so would you would you feel comfortable flying this across the North no, Atlantic right now? Absolutely not. So what do you North recommend? North the engine needs to be taken apart or another or another engine, period. Okay. If I was doing an annual on this, this would be unairworthy, period. Okay. It's oh, un wow. It's unairworthy. Next.
next time on Dangerous Flights. That's not how it works. We cannot authorize work on someone else's airplane. The tired old Cessna becomes too high maintenance, and her pilots threaten to walk. It might be time to hand it off to somebody else. And a new delivery job is heading straight into the path of a monster hurricane. Oh my god, lightning strike.